How can central banks support the restart of world economy? What are the responses of monetary policy to COVID-19? And how will these instruments reshape the international financial system? How does China's way of crisis management work? What will be the role of the renminbi in the post-COVID world economy? What could be the money of the future? What are the next steps in the evolution of the monetary system? Follow the high-level online event of international knowledge sharing The Budapest Renminbi Initiative 2021 Conference Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished speakers, dear audience, it is my utmost pleasure to greet you all today at the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference 2021. My name is Edith Salai and I am honored to be your host today at this important event. Due to the uncertainties of the pandemic, we meet in the virtual space, but I am sure this will not prevent us from having a dynamic and thought-provoking event. The Magyar Nemzeti Bank launched the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference in 2015 in connection with the Central Bank's Renminbi program. The international importance of the Renminbi is constantly growing. Consequently, the Budapest Renminbi Initiative was launched to expand the investment spectrum and financing sources of Hungary, and to foster Chinese-Hungarian economic partnership, especially the ties between the People's Bank of China and the Magyar Nemzeti Bank. The Budapest Renminbi Initiative's main goal is to strengthen Budapest's regional role in the Chinese-Central European economic relationship and promote the growth of cross-border economic activity. The Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference intends to contribute to these goals through the development of Chinese-Hungarian economic, diplomatic relations and international knowledge sharing. Unfortunately, the conference had to be cancelled last year due to the pandemic, but I am proud to announce that today marks the sixth year of the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference. This year's event is organized under the theme Central Banks, Vaccine Against COVID-19 and the Role of China and the RMB in the Post-Pandemic Era. The program will start with a high-level opening session, allowing us to listen to the insights and expertise of senior decision-makers and top diplomats who have first-hand experience from the world of international affairs. The high-level opening session will be followed by two panel discussions with the participation of senior decision-makers and renowned experts discussing the Renminbi's role in the China's way of crisis management and the development of central bank digital currency. As the first speaker of the high-level opening session, please welcome Mr. Mihai Potai, Deputy Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, the Central Bank of Hungary, who will deliver his opening speech. Deputy Governor, the floor is yours. Madam, <clears throat> Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good afternoon there and uh, good morning here. I am very happy that uh, I can welcome you on behalf of the management of the Hungarian Central Bank on this interesting conference, which is the sixth one. So we, we try to uh, uh, have it regularly. As, as the lady said, unfortunately, last year we couldn't do it. But this time, again, we come back to the, uh, to, to the basics. Special uh, uh, thanks to the to the speakers and to the participants of the panels and to those who are coordinating uh, the, the panels. The world will be completely changed after the COVID-19 crisis. This thesis practically is not questioned nor by, by scientific opinion, neither by the common sense, because everybody feels that something will be different in the future. And the real difference is that those two megatrends which we are which we were shaping up in the last 40 years will be decisive for the next couple of decades one vector which is the first megatrend is the digitalization including the the money the role of money itself we will deal with it uh, uh, during this conference 
And the other one is the, the green and sustainable development of the economy and the society. Both of them will shape practically the future of human mankind. During the last 40 years, when these two megatrends were shaping up, there was something else which was again very important, and this was the fact, the rise of China. In the last 40 years, what has happened is really unprecedented in the history of mankind. China's economic weight had gradually increased in recent decades. The economic and geopolitical weight of Asia is expected to continue to grow in the future. While the dollar continues to dominate the global trade, 70-75% you know, of global trade is dominated in, in dollars, share of trades denominated in Chinese renminbi have increased nearly five times in the last decade. In addition to this, renminbi in international foreign exchange reserves has been playing an increasingly important role. According to IMF data, in the last four years, it has tripled practically. China sets a very good example regarding crisis management, digitalization, and greed finance. The People Bank of China also successfully managed to offset the negative effects caused by the pandemic. The PBOC has used various instruments to help maintain the stability of the domestic and international renminbi markets. The PBOC is at the forefront of developing a central bank digital currency, which can reshape the whole way of how we think about money and central banking. And unlike other central banks who are talking about digital currency, central bank digital currency, the Chinese Central Bank got a step forward when they had an experiment with several million people on this issue, and they have valuable information about this experience, which will be helpful for everybody who, who is thinking about the introduction of this. More and more central banks are addressing environmental sustainability issues. China was among the first to recognize the importance of green finances. Here I would like to make a note regarding the Hungarian Central Bank's new mandate, the so-called fourth green mandate, which is a new phenomenon in Europe. A couple of weeks ago, the Hungarian parliament has amended the central bank law in Hungary, and they have ordered that beside the existing three mandates, which are price stability, financial regulation and supervision, supporting the, the government economic policy to execute a force mandate, the so-called green mandate, to enhance the green and sustainable development of the Hungarian economy. So for us, for the Hungarian Central Bank, there is no way back. We have to do it according to the law, not just because we want to do it. The Hungarian Central Bank closely follows PBOC on several fields. Let me just give you a couple of examples what would be very important for us, what would happen in the future. In 2013, the Central Bank of Hungary and PBOC entered a three-year bilateral foreign exchange swap agreement. And this was renewed two times in 2016 and 2019 and then supplemented last year. The renewal of the foreign exchange agreement supports the further development of bilateral economic and trade relations and further improvement of renminbi financial markets. And I have to tell you that it was very important for us as a stabilizing factor last year that we had this swap op opportunity from the Chinese Central Bank. The Hungarian and Chinese financial systems are becoming increase, in, increasingly interconnected. You know, for example, the Bank of China has a long history in Hungary, and the China Construction Bank is likely to start to operate in the near future. Based on an earlier decision, the Monetary Council ordered the Central Bank of Hungary to build up Chinese government securities portfolio as part of its, of its international reserves. So today, 
In the international reserves of this central bank, we have Chinese government bonds as well. Today's Renminbi conference is also a reflection of this unique cooperation, which we hope is going to continue in the future. I wish you all fruitful, inspiring, and dynamic discussions today, and I sincerely hope that this Renminbi Initiative 2021 conference will provide a great platform for professional dialogue. So I am looking forward to learn from you today. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor Potoyi, for the inspiring ideas that indeed set a great basis for the discussions of today. Following Deputy Governor Potoyi, I would like to ask His Excellency Mr. Peter Sijarto, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary, to deliver his opening speech. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Governor, it is my great honor and uh, pleasure to address you uh, on the occasion of the Budapest uh, Renminbi Initiative Conference. I wish uh, we could uh, be together, but currently I am closer to China uh, than to Budapest uh, physically. I am uh, extremely happy that this uh, conference uh, takes part uh, in Budapest today. The uh, timing is perfect since uh, COVID has accelerated the uh, changes of the global economy. A, a new age of global economy has uh, started and we all understand that uh, this uh, new age of global economy is launched by a tough competition, a competition uh, for the redistribution uh, of the capacities uh, of the global economy. We Hungarians have uh, entered into this race. We are competing for investments day by day. And I'm happy to uh, uh, see that our economic cooperation with the People's Republic of China helps a lot to be among the winners uh, of, this, uh, of these changes which have been taking place in the global economy during the recent uh, weeks and months and will take place in the upcoming uh, period uh, of time. You know, I still remember uh, 2010 when we have taken the office for the first time and uh, we have made a strategic decision to um, uh, introduce a political strategy called Eastern Opening in the framework of which uh, we have strengthened and enhanced our cooperation with the People's Republic of China. This cooperation is being based on uh, mutual respect and both countries, both economies would take a lot of benefit out of this cooperation in the recent years. We are proud to be the first Central European country to sign uh, the um, working plan on the Belt and Road Initiative. We are uh, proud that uh, Bank of China has not only uh, settled in Budapest but uh, established its uh, regional headquarters uh, in uh, Hungary. We are proud that last year Chinese investors brought the most investments uh, to uh, Hungary. In all cases, state-of-the-art technology, high added value and respected jobs for the uh, Hungarian uh, people. Uh, we uh, witness a uh, significant increase when it comes to the trade between uh, China and uh, Hungary, even during last year, which was a black year, a very tough year for global um, economy and global trade. We were able to increase our trade volume by 25%. And this year, there's an even, even bigger increase. We have uh, increased our exports to China by more than uh, 50%. Uh, so, uh, as uh, Hungary is competing now in order to be among the winners of this new uh, global age of economy, our cooperation, our economic and trade cooperation with China contributes a lot uh, to the uh, success. And this economic cooperation, this mutually beneficial economic cooperation is being based on a very, very fair, very good people-to-people -people contact, which contacts uh, have been strengthened uh, by the way, we have helped each other during uh, the first uh, phase uh, of the uh, global pandemic and we also honor and respect a lot 
that uh, we could buy 5 million jabs of Sinopharm vaccines from China, which contributed uh, to um, execute the quickest uh, vaccination campaign uh, in the European Union, saving lives of our people and enabling ourselves to, uh, ourselves to uh, relaunch our economy uh, pretty uh, quickly. So I wish um, uh, all of you a, a successful meeting, a successful conference and hopefully next time we will be able to meet in person also. Thank you, Minister Siarto, for giving us a comprehensive and in-depth summary of your views. As the final speaker of the high-level session, please welcome His Excellency Mr. Tayu Chi, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the People's Republic of China to Hungary. Ambassador Chi, welcome. Hungosi 展现了强大的韧劲和潜力中国在匈投资持续增长中东经济关系中的区域作用和促进中匈经贸合作方面后疫情时代随着连续稳定可持续的宏观政策有效实施中国有能力成为引领世界经济复苏并增长的可靠火车头之一。值得注意的是，后疫情时代，中国经济企稳，为人民币国际化提供了新的历史机遇。一方面，中国控制疫情的成功，实践和为国际社会提供的大量援助。为人民币国际定价权赢得了主动复苏回暖金融市场环境不断宽松 
人民币在后疫情时代成为越来越多交易结算的选择。二是人民币国际化环境不断优化，随着 RCEP 的签署，成员国直接经贸往来不断加深。人民币不仅被纳为各国的外汇储备，而且在各类消费市场、跨国贸易中被选择使用。随着中国对外贸易的稳中求进，人民币在国际定价和结算中的作用日益突出，其国际货币属性将进一步凸显。三是，人民币资产吸引力不断增强。随着各国各国量化宽松货币政策目标的实施，人民币标价资产作为安全性强、回报率高。流动性强、流动性好的目标资产吸引力显著增强。第三，人民币国际化将为中东经济复苏注入强劲动力。中欧都致力于引导全球向多极化、和平发展，有众多利益共同点。在中欧双方持续深化合作的背景下，人民币国际化。在欧洲，特别是中东欧地区，不仅将纵深发展，也将高度融合。人民币支付清算体系为跨境贸易投资发展提供重要支撑。中国高度重视人民币在中东欧地区发展。中国银行在匈牙利拥有子分行双牌照。去年升级为中东欧分行，是中东欧地区唯一的人民币清算行。目前，中国建设银行也已在匈设立分行。中国的各类金融机构正在与中东欧国家的合作伙伴一道，不断为跨境贸易和投资提供便利服务，推进人民币结算贸易和国际化发展。形成金融和经济相互促进的良性循环。二是，人民币国际化为“一带一路”倡议与向东开放政策的战略契合提供资金支持。中中间贸易和投资项目为人民币国际化提供了广阔的市场需求和发展平台。与此同时，人民币国际化的。不断深化发展，也为以匈塞铁路为代表的一系列投资项目提供了资金运用的便利化。中国中东欧市场关联是中国资本市场对外深入开放的重点。匈牙利是唯一一个同时发行典型债和熊猫债的主权国家。未来，中国将进一步拓展人民币欧洲债券市场，丰富人民币债券境内外发行人和投资人群体，促进中国中东欧金融市场的广泛融合。三是，人民币国际化将为国际金融市场注入新的活力。随着绿色债券、碳交易市场的扩大。相关金融产品的丰富和交易形式的多样化，人民币将进一步拓展跨境应用的场景，更广泛参与国际金融市场的发展。当前，世界主要经济体均在积极考虑或推进央行数字货币研发，依托数字货币和互联网商业的先发优势。中国也愿意加大与中东欧国家的沟通交流，加强在数字金融领域的合作。朋友们，中匈双边关系正处于历史最好时期。匈牙利在中国、中东欧国家合作中一直发挥着引领作用。我们愿继续推动“一带一路”倡议与向东开放政策。高度对接，推动中匈金融领域多层次立体化合作，进一步造福两国和两国人民，打造更紧密的中匈命运共同体。谢谢大家。
Thank you, Mr. Chi, for highlighting such important aspects of the Chinese-Hungarian relations. After the remarkable speeches of the high-level opening session, we move to our first panel discussion today, focusing on China's way of crisis management and the role of the renminbi in the post-COVID world economy. I am glad to greet on stage Mr. Adam Bonai, Executive Director of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank as the moderator of the discussion. Other than being Executive Director for Monetary Policy and Foreign Exchange Management, Mr. Bonai is also a member of the Financial Stability Board and leader of the China Working Group at Magyar Nemzeti Bank. He is a guest lecturer and a member of the Advisory Board at ESCP, Europe Institute of Real Estate Finance and Management, and assistant professor at the John von Neumann University of Kachkamit. His main research fields are stress testing, systematic risk, macroprudential policy, and the real estate market. He has published several papers and articles in high-level journals. Mr. Bonai, the panel is titled China's Way of Crisis Management, and its main questions are, how does the RMB support the restart of the world economy, and what will be the role of the RMB in the post-COVID world economy? and in the reshaping international financial system. The coronavirus pandemic has sped up the evolution of the whole financial system and the world's leading central banks, including the People's Bank of China. What do you think? What has been the biggest challenge for central banks in the last year and a half, and what could be in the next decade? Yeah. First of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to this conference. It's, I'm really glad to be here. And to, to answer your question, I think, uh, we have to be clear with that that this crisis was very special uh, in several regards so the economic uh, policy actors and uh, within it the central banks have faced a very special type of crisis contrast to 2008 uh, it wasn't uh, the cause of, of of some structural imbalances or or problems of the financial markets but a very special reason some health issue the pandemia and for this reason, we have faced uh, 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 lasting uh, uncertainty in the real economy uh, and on financial markets as well. So the central banks, as a first and very important step, uh, uh, provided all the liquidity, what was needed for all the, the economic actors from the financial system to, to real economic actors as well. And I think uh, central banks were very successful in this regard. So I, uh, I believe and I hope that the worst is behind us, but uh, 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 the central banks will, will play a key role in restarting the economy as well. And I think this recovery cannot be complete uh, without uh, a transformation of the economy for a longer horizon. I think two type of transformation is, is needed for, for the global economy and, and for all the countries. First is digitalization and the second is environment sustainability. Uh, why? Uh, I think what, what, what was clear after the crisis or, or, or in the crisis that our lifestyle today is very fragile. So we used to have several types of services and we didn't believe before the crisis that uh, uh, the, the access of, of this type of service can be limited. But uh, we have a very new experience, so we ha have to restructure the, uh, the economy from this perspective as well. Uh, and digitalization will be one of the most important and key factor in the future. And I think China is, is in the forefront of digitalization, so uh, uh, this is uh, a key reason why we have to, uh, have to talk uh, more about Chinese experiences. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you will be deeper into the topic during the discussion. Mr. Bonai, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, our lead speaker today is Ms. Mei Jin. Uh, Chief Representative of the People Bank of China, Representative Office for Europe, who will talk about the crisis management in China, the central bank's role in the environment sustainability, and last but not least, about the future of Chinese Central European financial relationships. 
Uh, Ms. Jean joined the PBOC in 2002 and has been leading uh, the representative office in London since 2016. She's also the chief editor of London RMB Business Quarterly, a report co-published by the City of London and the PBOC representative office for Europe. Prior to her current position, she worked in several leader positions in the central bank, where she was responsible for macroeconomic monitoring, analysis and forecast, monetary policy research and RMB internationalization. Ms. Jean, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Mr. Anai, and also many thanks for the invitation. It is a great pleasure for me to attend Budapest the Minbi Initiative 2021 conference. Today, I'd like very much to share with you some of my observations on three issues. Sorry, I cannot. Okay, got it. First, China's way of COVID-19 pandemic crisis management on monetary policy. Second, the future of central banking and the PBOC's role in environmental sustainability. Third, the future of Chinese central European financial relationships. In first quarter 2020, the sudden outbreak of COVID-19 had an unprecedented impact on China's economic and the social development. China coordinated pandemic containment with economic and the social development and became the first country in the world to contain the pandemic successfully and thus to resume work and production and see positive growth 2020. What did we do right? First, by leveraging quantitative monetary policy tools, we expanded aggregate supply with a focus on easing financing difficulties including required reserve ratio cut, central bank lending and the central bank discount, a program for supporting credit-based loans to micro and small business and the freest deferment of loan principal and interest rate payments for micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. After significant results were achieved in pandemic containment and the life and the work returned to normal at a fast pace. The monetary policy started to prioritize stability to maintain normal monetary policy space. Second, by advancing the market-based interest rate reform, we get it a continuous decline of market risk and promoted the financial sector to reasonably mark down profit to support enterprises. In an attempt to elevate high financing costs, third, by strengthening write off and the dispose disposal of bank non-performing loans, we made efforts to solve the sustainability problem related to support of the financial sector for the real economy. But these measures, China's economy has steadily recovered as a reflection of China's economic fundamentals the RMB exchange rate kept basically stable. Foreign investors actively invest the RMB assets. China conducted sound monetary policy 
did not adopt zero or negative interest rate or quantitative easing. Now, China is one of the few major economies that conduct normal monetary policy. Before the pandemic, the overall macro level ratio, uh, the macro leverage ratio stabilized as around 250%, which has one room to increase counter cyclical adjustment in response to the pandemic. In 2020, affected by the pandemic, China, China's macro leverage ratio increased temporarily, but it is expected to gradually return to a stable level. Regard the PBC's role and the instruments in supporting environmental sustainability, China has announced the goal of peak carbon emission by 2030 and achieving carbon neutrality by 2060, also known as the 3060 goal. The PPC attached great importance to green finance and placed a priority on green finance development, featuring three major functions and the five major pillars. Three major function refers to fully leverage three major functions of finance. Resource allocation, risk management, and market pricing in supporting green and low carbon development. Five major pillars means a system of green finance standards, supervisory and information disclosure requirement for financial institutions, incentive and constraint mechanism, green financial products and their market system and international cooperation on green finance. Last but not the least, I'd like to share with you some of my observation on the growing international role of the RMB and the future of the Chinese Central European financial relations. The RMB internationalization was further developed as the RMB has increasingly used in cross-border payment and the financing worldwide in 2020. More foreign central banks held RMB dominated assets as reserves and the RMB as an invoicing currency witnessed remarkable progress. The RMB played a positive role in the international monetary system. In 2020, the cross-border use of the RMB grew rapidly despite of the pandemic. The RMB growth as a reserve currency is said to accelerate it. According to the Global Public Investor 2021, published by the OMFIF, 30% of the central bank response plan to add to their RMB holding over the next 12 to 24 months, will 50% plan, 70% uh, plan to increase their involvement over a long-term horizon. Morgan Stanley analyst predicted recently that the RMB could account for between 5% and 10% of the global foreign exchange reserve assets by 2030. That potential level would surpass the Japanese yen and the British pound, making the renminbi the third most recognized currency after the American dollar and the euro. In recent years, China has intensified its cooperation with the CEE countries, 
financial institutions in China and the CE countries are encouraged to strengthen existing investment and the financing cooperation on a voluntary basis and to open up new channels for investment and the financing according to market demand. Introduce the new financial tools, enhance the linkage between banks and enterprises and explore cooperation in RMB financing and the Eastern Green financial bonds. China will come the central banks of CE countries to, to include the RMB in their foreign exchange reserve and invest China bond market. Thank you. I will look forward to our discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jin. Uh, I think it was a very interesting summary uh, on China, and it is truly important for all of us since uh, China was the fastest uh, uh, in, in the recovery phase uh, after the pandemic. So I think we can learn a lot from, from the Chinese experience. So uh, my first question would be, is, uh, you mentioned many uh, uh, measures you have made uh, in China, but uh, what do you think, what was the key to this fast recovery uh, for the Chinese economy? Um, I think the key uh, to the success uh, crisis management from an economic policy point view is to provide all-round support to the real economy, especially MSBs. First, relieving the burden of enterprises by large-scale tax cut and the fee reduction immediately. Second, lowering the financing cost of enterprises substantially by applying a mix monetary policy tools, including required reserve ratio cuts. Third, encouraging banks to offer deferment on loan repayments for enterprises and the issue unsecured inclu inclusive MSB loans by providing central bank funding support as appropriate. First, urging commercial banks reduce fees charged on enterprises and cut profit in favor of the real economy. According to estimates following the principle of commercial sustainability, the financial sector eased the burden on market and identities around RMB 1.5 trillion in 2020 through interest cut reduction of fees, deferment of loan principal and interest repayments and other measures. Five, supporting enterprises, restructuring and the diet for equity swaps. Thank you. Thanks. Uh you also talked about environment, environmental sustainability, which is very important for the Central Bank of Hungary, since uh, it, is, uh, it is in our mandate to support environment sustainability. And I, I see that uh, PBOC has also uh, made some steps in, uh, in this direction. But it seems that it is still a great debate globally whether the central bank has a role in, in environmental sustainability or not. Uh, my question would be, that what is your opinion on, on the role of central banks in environmental sustainability? And what are the plans of the PBOC in this regard? Uh, yeah, uh, I think central banks can play and should play an important role in supporting the green transition of the <clears throat> economy. Central banks could contribute to the net zero goal in many ways, such as developing a strong policy system and diversified market system and uh, enhancing international cooperation. According to our governor, Mr. Uh, Yi Gang, uh, PPC will make progress in the following area for the next few years. First, 
mobilizing public and the private funds to support the green economy in line with market principles. The PPC plan to set up a mandatory disclosure system with uniform standards and promote greater information sharing between financial institutions and the companies. The PPC plans to finish revising the green bond catalog by removing fossil fuel projects. The PPC plans to launch a support target to provide low cost funds for carbon emission reduction. The PPC will also support green finance through a host of measures ranging from commercial credit ratings, deposit insurance rates to collaterals for open market operation. Second, evaluating the potential impact of climate change on financial stability. The PPC is looking at the possibility of including climate factors in financial stress test and gradually incorporating climate risks into the macroprudential policy framework. The PPC is reviving green loan and green bond performance of financial institutions on a quarterly basis. The financial institutions are encouraged to evaluate and manage their environmental and climate, uh, climate risks. Third, letting the carbon market play his role of price discovery. Financial regulators should be involved in supervision of the carbon market. The carbon market should be a financial market in nature and allow carbon financial derivatives trading. This will make sure that all risks are fully priced in so that the carbon price play a better role of serving either as an incentive or constraint. Thank you. Thank you very much for your interesting thought. And I would suggest to go forward uh, with the panel discussion. So let me welcome uh, on the stage uh, the participants of the panel discussion. First, Mr. Zoltan Kurali, who is the Chief Executive of, uh, Officer of the Government Debt uh, Management Agency in Hungary since 2019. During his career, he worked for several commercial banks in high-level position. Before his current position, he led the Deutsche Bank Hungary. Uh, let me also welcome Mr. Domenico Nardelli, he is heading the Treasury Department at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and responsible for the investment of the bank's liquid assets, capital markets operations, and asset and liability management. Before joining the AIIB, he was treasurer of the International Fund for Agricultural Development in Italy. During his earlier years, he spent several years in investment banking in the UK and gained experience in debt management in Italian institutions and international organizations like the IMF. And let me also welcome Ms. Hong Jong. Uh, she's the Deputy General Manager of Research Institute at the Bank of China Head Office. Dr. Jong served as the Executive Director of China International Finance Society and directed several important research projects on RMB internationalization. She is the executive deputy editor in chief of two academic journals, International Finance and Studies of International Finance. So let me welcome all of you in the panel discussion. And after this interesting in, uh, introduction with Ms. Chin, uh, I, I would go forward uh, with our questions. And the first question goes to all of you. Uh, as we see China's weight in the world economy grows fastly, the international weight of the renminbi has also increased in the recent years. Uh, my question would be how do you assess the international role of renminbi at the moment and how does the Chinese currency stand against the world's leading currencies in terms of cross-border payments and international credit claims? And 
can it have a role like the dollar has? Uh, and if you think that it can have a role like the dollar, then it will be uh, true. So first, I would turn to Mr. Kurali. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so first and foremost, I think it's an exciting and fascinating question. And uh, Ms. Chin's uh, um, opening presentation obviously provided with a lot of important data to assess this question. I think uh, Chinese government's objectives with the Renminbi are very, very clear. They want to develop this into a trustworthy, widely used reserve and, uh, and trade currency, um, which basically requires the RMB to be widely accepted as a general currency of payment, as an international reserve currency, as well as uh, Ramnimbi instruments should play an important role in the international capital markets, bonds, loans, as well as equities. So I looked at some data uh, to somehow um, justify my argument. Um, as you know, world money demand um, is a function of world GDP growth. And at the moment, uh, the U United States is 24% of world GDP. Uh, China is 17%, EU is 18%, and Japan is 6 uh, However, China is growing very fast, and its share in world G GDP is increasing um, um, at, a, at a very, very quick pace. Um, and that um, creates a likelihood that China is going to overtake uh, the United States um, as the world largest economy within years, somewhat earlier than earlier predictions uh, in the 2030s. Um, at the same time, if you look at global trade as well as global reserve, um, the U US dollars is still, you know, sort of more than three fourths of global trade. Um, so like 80% type, type number, um, and still 60% of global reserves. Um, why is that? Because this system developed over a very, very long time, and it is very hard to actually make a very fast change. But if you look at the, 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 the pace of change, the RMB is the fastest growing reserve currency um, you know, as a percentage um, um, of, of previous years. Interesting fact that um, as a percentage of stock market capitalization, picture slightly better um, because, you know, while the U.S. is still 43% of uh, global uh, equity market capitalization, China is over 10% now, and uh, the European Union is less than, is around 9 So So that is also showing this, uh, this development. Commodities are still dominated in US dollars, um, which obviously many governments are trying to sort of redenominate commodities in their own currencies in, in sort of like regional trade. But I think it's an important um, factor, you know, that kind of preserves uh, the dominance of, um, of, the, of, the, of the US dollars. Interesting fact that even cryptocurrencies have a denomination in US dollars, which is, which is obviously uh, a telling fact. Um, so if you look at, you know, there are countering arguments. I mean, obviously, if you look at trade, um, it is good to have a diversification because this massive US dollar dominance kind of like involves a huge dominance on, on US monetary policy. And if the Fed needs to actually also take into account global trade as part of their monetary policy, other than sort of their own country and their own system, it's, it's a very complex task. And, 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 you know, this exposure to a single country's monetary policy in global trade finance is probably long, long run not as, uh, as beneficial. But on the other hand, from an FX risk management point of view, companies and users of currencies probably welcome a uh, more or less dominant single currency. So I think these factors kind of, you know, move against each other and, and, and sort of result in um, probably an increasing share of, of the euro as well as the RMB on a, on, a, on a long run. And I think to conclude, what makes this even more fascinating is obviously the role of cryptocurrencies in, in, in all this and, 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 and China's, you know, very uh, determined effort uh, on digitalization and digital central bank currency. And I think that will enhance um, the RMB's um, sort of uh, journey and role uh, on a long run. But certainly this competition is, is very interesting to watch. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, 
I would turn to Mr. Nadal in our virtual state, uh, stage. Uh, what is your view in this issue? Adam, uh, thank you. Uh, from, from my position uh, as treasurer of AIB, uh, I, I am privileged because I, I have been watching the developments in this particular market over the past uh, couple of years uh, from uh, Beijing. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, learning a lot and gathering a lot of information. Um, I, would, uh, I would very much agree with what uh, Zoltan said, uh, that a lot of the, the momentum uh, on, uh, um, uh, on the renminbi is uh, driven by uh, economic activity. From my side, I, I see two separate channels uh, for development that are shaping the role of the renminbi in the international context. One is from the reserve point of view, so more related to official institutions, central banks, and the, and the other one is more kind of financial. The latter, the, the more financial developments are very clear to me, and uh, uh, the, the appreciation of the renminbi over the past uh, several months are uh, proved to, uh, to that. And these are driven uh, by sustained uh, uh, interest from uh, overseas investors to gain exposure to the Chinese economy. Uh, Ms. Mei Jin, in her intervention, she uh, underscored the fact uh, that uh, China is one of the few countries where there is still a kind of what she called like a normalized uh, monetary policy. Uh, China didn't go into negative, uh, into negative rates territory. Uh, if you look at uh, the developments in the uh, bond markets in 10 years, for example, 10-year uh, rates in China are still around 3%, uh, whereas uh, uh, in many developed markets, they are really depressed, if not negative, like in Euro, Japan, Switzerland, many other countries, Netherlands, and many others. So this... Um, coupled with the strong uh, momentum of the uh, Chinese economy that uh, Zoltan also referred to, has driven a lot of interest uh, by institutional investors in the financial markets to get exposure to the, to the Chinese uh, economy. This has also been facilitated by a number of uh, technical interventions and, and reforms that the Chinese authorities have done to the plumbing of the uh, uh, of the bond markets uh, in China by facilitating so-called connectivity of overseas investors and enter into the China interbank uh, bond markets. This has been really facilitated by many, uh, uh, many changes, many technical changes um, to the trading, uh, um, uh, settlement, clearing systems, and this has facilitated a lot of inflows into the market. And I can confirm this because we have seen it firsthand. Um, last year, we uh, issued a, a debut Panda bond for AIB, denominated in renminbi, of course. Uh, and this bond, of course, was uh, was uh, was executed uh, domestically, but however, attracted the majority of interest from the 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 very best uh, uh, selection of uh, international institutional investors. So you can see, so two thirds of that bond were, was sold uh, overseas and it was in renminbi. So you could sense that there is a demand, a strong demand from the international investor community uh, to uh, find highly attractive assets to get exposure to, to the Chinese uh, economy. So in the financial market, this is, can be seen very clearly. For, for me, the, the picture is a little bit more difficult to understand on the official sector and the reserves sector. So the, the, there still is strong momentum for the renminbi. Uh, I think, again, Ms. Meijin cited some very interesting developments that uh, in various surveys, uh, a strong majority of official institutions uh, are increasing or are planning to increase their domestic, their, their holdings in, uh, in renminbi, in their reserves. However, um, I followed very closely, I have worked at the IMF previously, and I, I have followed very closely all the interest that there was in the development of the renminbi as an international uh, currency. 
And when the, um, the SDR basket was changed uh, at the IMF to uh, uh, introduce the renminbi and give it a, a quite high uh, a percentage, uh, uh, higher than the uh, Japanese yen and the, and the pound sterling, at the time, the, I think that there was an expectation that the renminbi was going to pick up quite quickly in terms of, as, a, as an international means of payment. Now, if you fast forward uh, uh, quite a few years down the road, yes, there has been an increase. Um, there is no doubt that there has been an increase uh, in payments uh, regulated in renminbi. However, the, the share of payments, you know, transactions through, through the SWIFT uh, banking systems uh, uh, is still quite low compared to the size of the Chinese economy in the system. And this is something that coming to Asia, moving to Asia from Europe, I've been a little bit surprised to see that there still is, uh, 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 let's say, a, a kind of lesser than expected, for me at least, uh, uh, um, involvement uh, in uh, using the renminbi as a, a, as a means of payment. For example, I work for an international organization that extends loans to member countries. And moving to Asia, I would have expected to see more demand for renminbi denominated loans instead of dollars, for example, at least from countries that are, uh, uh, that are strong trading partners uh, uh, of China and uh, maybe their central banks uh, hold uh, quite a high share of their reserves uh, in renminbi. Uh, so far, however, we have only seen demand for renminbi denominated loans domestically in China, but not in the Asian, uh, in the Asian region. Again, this is something that is, I am not a central banker, so uh, uh, of course there is an arrangement for, uh, with the renminbi in terms of uh, uh, convertibility, and this is not really my field to comment, but I have been surprised to, to experience uh, uh, this compared to instead you know, the size and the prominence of the Chinese economy in the global system, which is clearly uh, uh, increasing uh, at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zhong, probably you have the uh, most first-hand experience about renminbi. How do you assess the international role of, of the currency? Okay. Hello, Mr. Bonayi. Thank you for your introduction. I'm honored to attend this important and valuable conference. Uh, Mrs. Mei Jin's speech and the two moderators' opinions inspired me a lot. As for your question, I would like to share with you some of my opinions. As all of you have mentioned, in recent years, the cross-border use of the renminbi has sustained rapid growth. Even under the impact of the COVID-19, China is a major economy that achieved positive growth in the world. And the cross-border use of the renminbi has maintained robust growth. Firstly, the payment function of renminbi has continuously enhanced. According to the SWIFT, renminbi ranks the fifth largest payment currency worldwide from where it was 10 years ago as the 17th largest. In the first half of this year, China's cross-border renminbi settlement amounted to 19.6 trillion yuan, increasing by 39% year on year. Secondly, the investment and financing function of renminbi constantly deepened. More and more domestic and foreign entities choose they are financing to be nominated in renminbi and take it as an important option for asset allocation and risk management. By the end of the first half of this year, the amount of the financial assets, including domestic renminbi stocks and bonds held by foreign entities has reached an all-time high of 10 trillion renminbi yuan. Thirdly, the reserve function of renminbi has further highlighted. 
according to an incomplete statistics. More than 70 central banks or monetary authorities incorporated the renminbi into their foreign ex exchange reserves. By the end of the first quarter of 2021, renminbi became the fifth largest international reserve currency, accounting for 2.45% of the total foreign exchange reserves. In the future, I think the statics of renminbi in the international monetary policy will rise steadily. According to Bank of China's latest survey of more than 3,300 samples from home and abroad, that 80% of domestic and foreign industrial and commercial enterprise respondents anticipated the international status of renminbi not inferior to that of Japanese yen and Great Britain pound in the next decade. Currency internationalization is a epitomization of a country's economic stress and comprehensive competitiveness. I think with the development and opening up of China, the internet internationalization of renminbi is an inevitable process driven by the market fundamentally. We are confident that renminbi will gradually develop into one of the major international currencies in the future. However, there are two opinions two points to note here. Firstly, I think renminbi internationalization will not stand against the world's leading currencies. China respects the existing framework of the international monetary system, deepens the complementary cooperation between the renminbi and the major international currencies and works with them to improve the global econ economic and financial stability. Secondly, I think the original intention and goal of renminbi internationalization is to serve the real economy. Therefore, the development path of renminbi interna internationalization is different from other major currencies. The internationalization of renminbi will insist on market orientation, helping enterprises and other entities reduce exchange rate risk, increasing financing channels, and promoting higher level of trade and investment facilitation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you also, also mentioned uh, the central banks and uh, the central bank's experiences with the renminbi. Uh, as Deputy Governor Pate said, you know, the Central Bank of Hungary also has some experience with the, with the renminbi. And what we see that the role of renminbi at central bank reserves uh, is growing. And also uh, some central banks has a bilateral swap agreement with the PBOCs which also underlines that the role of renminbi uh, is growing for central banks as well. So what is your opi uh, opinion uh, uh, on this? Why central banks need the renminbi? Dr. Jong? Yes, uh, as I mentioned, renminbi becomes more attractive to the global central banks in recent years. By the first quarter of 2021, the scale of renminbi reserves has reached 287.5 billion US dollars, increased more than twice that of five years ago. In my opinion, it mainly relates to four aspects. Firstly, China has closed economic and trade ties with other countries in the world. As we all know, China's foreign trade and investment 
are at the forefront of the world. China is not only the supplier and consumer market of goods and services of many countries, but also the source and destination of investment for many countries. Extensive and solid economic, trade, and investment ties have become the cornerstone of financial cooperation between countries, deepening the bilateral local currency cooperation. We also noticed that more and more central banks or monetary authorities have signed bilateral currency swap arrangements with the People's Bank of China to serve the development of economic and trade exchanges. By the end of August of this year, the scale of bilateral local currency swap arrangements has reached 3.6 trillion yuan, covering major develop, developed and emerging economies in the world, as well as the major offshore markets. Secondly, the returns on renminbi assets are relatively considerable. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19, the major central banks have released unlimited uh, liquidity, or we, we call it QE, and the global interest rates have dropped to an all-time low, even turning negative. At present, the global scale of negative interest rate bonds is about 15 trillion US dollars. In contrast, China's monetary policy has always remained in the normal range. The interest rate level is moderate and the return on renminbi assets is higher. The yield spread of government bonds between China and the United States, the euro area, or Japan has been positive for a long time. Their yield spread of 10-year government bonds has been even as high as 2% to 4%. If the comprehensive return of interest rate and exchange rate is calculated, the return on renminbi assets in the past year and a half is more than twice of that of other major countries. Thirdly, renminbi asset is of, is of high security. The current international financial market is highly volatile, so the global central banks pay more attention to risk prevention and risk management and are more willing to promote the diversification of reserve currencies. In this regard, renminbi has greater appeal. China has the world's second largest capital market and its financial price, dips and stability are forefront among emerging markets. Meanwhile, as currency of an emerging market, renminbi has low correlation with the currency of major developed economies such as the US dollar. Even in the most turbulent March of 2020, US stocks fell by about uh, 29%. We all see that time. While China's stock market went down only by uh, almost 9%. Fourthly, China's financial market continues to be further open. In recent years, China's stocks have been included into mainstream benchmark indicates such as MSCI, FTSE, Brussels, and the Standard and Poor's and Chinese bonds have been included into the Bloomberg Backlash Global Aggregate Index, the JP Morgan Government Bond Index, Emerging Markets, the FTSE World Government Bond Index, and so on which have been fully recognized by the international community. The investment channels for foreign institutions to invest in domestic financial markets keep widening. Investment agency services are continuously facilitated. The market entry process has been greatly streamlined. 
which has promoted the willingness of central banks to hold renminbi as reserve assets. Uh, as for our bank, Bank of China accounts for nearly half of the total number of overseas renminbi clearing, clearing banks and the total amount of cross-border renminbi clearing and settlement have long remained the first in the world. And Bank of China has successfully ensured, ensured several renminbi dominated international bonds for the Hungarian government and is willing to provide high quality services for the Hungarian central bank to participate in the renminbi market. That's my answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, could I um, could I follow up to some of the points that uh, Hong Xiong made? For, for, for sure, I think uh, uh, very briefly because we are uh, a little bit running out of time, so, but uh, do so. Thank you, Adam. I just wanted to uh, emphasize what Hong Zhong has said in terms of, again, the, the yield level. Uh, even if you are in an official institution and managing reserves for a central bank, we know that the emphasis is on capital preservation However, return is also a concern, and many central banks decline this in different uh, manners. Uh, but again, when you look at the Chinese, uh, uh, the Chinese bond market, this is one of the few places uh, where there is a fairly developed bond market, a very large and growing bond market, and you can still find some yield. And uh, if you are at the central bank, normally, the type of currencies and exposures that you were used to taking before, you know, in the Swiss francs, for example, Japanese yen, in terms of diversification, many of those markets are now in negative yield territory. And so I think this is playing and will play a big factor in the, in the diversification of uh, 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 global, global reserves, including the fact the, of the sheer growth of the uh, Chinese bond market. You know, as we go forward, you can expect that China will be added to more and more indices. And so if you are a portfolio manager, you will be able to, uh, uh, you will not be able to ignore this, this market from your holdings. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, and you, uh, you've been ta talking about the diversification, which would have been my, my next question. So uh, I turn briefly to Zoltan uh, about diversification issue and the, the role of renminbi on a state level. Uh, for sure, from textbooks in the universities, we learned that especially in crisis time, diversification is, is, is truly important. So how do you see on a state level uh, the, the diversification potentials of renminbi? So <clears throat> thank you very much, very briefly. I mean, obviously, um, having multiple choices of funding that are relatively uncorrelated um, is, is great because obviously that reduces risk. Um, so from that point of view, obviously our Hungary's debt management policy and strategy is, is built upon the base of, of this principle, i.e. to diversify investor bases, diversify across markets, uh, currencies, as well as, um, as, well as um, um, sort of pockets of liquidity um, and the ESG is obviously one, one, one of, 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 of that new uh, diversification tool in a way. Um, so what we have, obviously we issued in Remnimbi, we, we have issued Remnimbi uh, bonds um, and we will issue RMB bonds in the future as well um, as part of our foreign currency debt portfolio. On the foreign currency debt side, we have a very strict rule to uh, keep foreign currency denominated debt, which is obviously all in euros because even the non-euro we swap into um, into euros uh, between a range of 10 to 20 percent. This is uh, actually based on a model calculation that we run internally to reduce risk, um, but also sort of to improve on the on the on the cost uh, risk profile because obviously domestic uh, instruments are more expensive. 
Um, and um, we also have uh, obviously a very large presence in a super liquid uh, domestic institutional Hungarian foreign uh, market, which is free for everyone to invest, um, domestic uh, as well as interna international. So Domenico, if you want to buy some high yielding assets, Hungarian foreign government bonds are there uh, for a consideration. And the last but not least, very importantly, 25% of our total debt is in retail debt, which is directly sold to retail through our own network as well as um, as well as the banks uh, at a higher rate that we set, not the market, uh, which provides for a real yield for retail investors. Um, but we ring fence it such very, very tightly that institutions cannot buy. And with that, I think we established you know, sort of a, um, an uncorrelated portfolio, um, which is long maturity enough and in the foreign currency portion, um, RMB plays a role. And I think in the ESG portion, RMB will play a role, but more uh, on that uh, in the, you know, when we discuss the last question. Thank you. Uh... We have talked about uh, many different aspects from central banks to the state to some bond markets. Uh, and part of the internationalization of, of RMB, uh, there is the so called going out strategy, which is also very important. Uh, several uh, uh, branches were, were, were established in different parts of, uh, of the globe by, by, by the big uh, Chinese bank. Hungary was also. Uh, one of the winner of this strategy and my question would be how do you see the the success until now of this, this program how do you see the role of this program in the central and eastern european countries uh, and i would turn to uh, dr jong thank you for your question uh, i think as reform and opening up deepens china has closer economic and financial and trade exchange with the world, and more and more Chinese enterprises go global. Chinese banks are committed to serving these enterprises with, with actual needs while they go global. Uh, take Bank of China as an example here. As the most internationalized Chinese bank, Bank of China strives to create a new pattern of global development with serving the national strategies and supporting the real economy as its core goal. In 2020, the total deposits and loans of overseas commercial banks of Bank of China were equivalent to 285.1 billion US dollars and 407.8 billion US dollars respectively, with a year-on-year -year increase of 6.8% and 4.6%. And the profit contribution of the group reached 18.8%. Bank of China currently has 559 overseas branches covering 61 countries and regions, including 25 countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. Bank of China has built a comprehensive service platform covering commercial banks, investment banks, direct investment, security, insurance, funds, aircraft leasing, asset management, financial technology, financial leasing, and other areas, thus providing its customers with high quality, efficient, personalized, and all-round comprehensive financial services. It can be seen that Chinese banks going global shows the following trends. First, the institutional layout extends from the International Financial Center to the whole world. Second, overseas business have grown steadily and been continuously diversified. Third, it provides services not only to Chinese customers, but also gradually to 
local enterprises and residents. Fourth, the talent system is more professional and international, and more foreign employees have joined us. Uh, you asked where is the most attractive market? I think the CEE region, including Hungary, is one of them. In the past nine years, the pragmatic cooperation between China and the CEE countries has progressed steadily in various fields. Compared with where it was nine years ago, China's trade with CEE countries has increased by nearly 85%, and the number of tourists exchange has increased by nearly four times. China Europe Railway Express has covered most CEE countries, and a number of major projects such as uh, Hungary Siberia Railway have been promoted in an orderly manner. In February of this year, during the summit of China and Central and Eastern Europe countries, President Xi Jinping proposed that China plans to import more than 170 billion US dollars worth of goods from CEE and strive for an increase of 50% in amount of bilateral agriculture trade in the next five years. So it can be seen that there are broad prospects for cooperation between China and the CEE and huge financial business opportunities. Bank of China attaches great importance to the CEE markets, including Hungary. Bank of China CEE Co. Limited has four cross-border secondary institutions in Austria, the Kazakh Republic, uh, the Kazakh Republic, uh, Siberia, and Romania, forming a strategic layout centered on Hungary and radiating other CEE regions. Bank of China will continue to give full play to its advantages of globalization and integration provide Chinese and local customers with high quality and comprehensive financial services, and make new contributions to serving the economic and trade exchanges between China and the CEE. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just because we have not too many time left, uh, just uh, some quick reaction from Mr. Nardelli uh, on this issue. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, Adam, I, I think this is a, a very logical and uh, um, I would say also common in terms of uh, establishing a presence uh, overseas. Normally, uh, you know, the banking sector, when you uh, set up uh, institutions overseas, you will uh, normally focus on helping, uh, uh, assisting uh, uh, your own uh, enterprises as they want to establish a presence, a footprint uh, in that particular jurisdiction, maybe uh, make some acquisitions, M&A activity, and so forth. And then gradually, you will expand to more uh, uh, retail uh, activity. So I see the strategy that uh, Ms. Jong uh, just uh, explained as entirely uh, natural. Uh, I see uh, that it's been already quite a few years that the Chinese banks uh, are practicing that. And not only I've seen that in Europe, but I think it's also uh, happening in, uh, in other parts of the world, in particular the South American continent, in Brazil, for example, some of the African countries. And uh, this, has been, this is the model that has been followed also in reverse by, by banks uh, uh, from other uh, uh, from other nations as they have expanded overseas. So again, I, I, I don't have much to add. I see it entirely uh, entirely logical as a, as a strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have just one last question. Uh, and I would like to ask you to, to uh, give just some quick answers. Uh, it is a very important uh, issue. Uh, 
we would need another hour, but we have only a few minutes. So uh, let's go to the green bonds issue because China has a very active green bond market. And my question would be that uh, how do you see the green bond market in China? How do other players uh, will have a role in this market? Why it is it is good to uh, to issue green bonds? Why it is good for companies, for, for other players, for example, for the state? Uh, so. Uh, as a whole, how do you see, see the potentials for, for, for green bonds? Uh, Dr. Zhang? Uh, thank you. Uh, Chinese green bond market has developed rapidly and attracted many insurers and investors. In my opinion, enterprises choose green bond financing mainly based on the following four considerations. The first is about its cost advantage. Under the same conditions, the issuing interest rate of green bond is lower than that of traditional bond. The second is about its multiple categories. In recent years, the categories of green bonds are gradually diversified and the forms are constantly innovated. The third is about policy support. In recent years, countries have introduced a series of policies covering fiscal, monetary, regulatory, industrial, and other fields to promote green transformation and green financial development. The fourth is about reputation. The practice of corporate ESG has attractive extensive attention of global consumers and investors. Uh, globally, green bond financing has broad prospects and huge potential in the future, I believe. Currently, 126 countries and regions around the world have officially announced all are considering putting forward net zero emission targets. Green recovery has become the new direction of the world after the pandemic. Extensive and profound statistics changes will take place in the economy, industrial, investment, and lifestyle, and so will the financial system. And as a a sanitary member of principles for responsible banking of green finance. Bank of China take green bonds as one of key business areas. As of the first half of this year, the balance of green credit of Bank of China had exceeded 1 trillion MMB yuan, assisting customers to issue 50.9 trillion yuan to green bonds in China. And the underwriting volume and investment volume ranked first among Chinese commercial banks. Bank of China is willing to participate in and support the development of local green financial market and contribute to the sustainable development of Hungary in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kurali, uh, uh, you have some experiences on a state level on green bonds. What, what is your view? Sure. So Hungary um, is a green bond issuer now um, since uh, 2020. So we issued euros, uh, one and a half billion, 15 year. We issued in Japanese yen, and we have started to issue in Hungarian foreign. Um, to this date, uh, there was no foreign country that issued um, in the um, in the panda market. Uh, what I can tell you is that's uh, not for too much longer. Um, and we leave it uh, just like that. Um, I think it's a very important tool um, for investor diversification. Um, and I'm speaking generally not only on behalf of a sovereign issuer, but I think it's, it's, it's a very different investor base. It's a very demanding investor base. And as a result, I think it helps 
um, companies as well as government issuers to go through a transformation and um, and essentially through the reporting system that is associated allocation uh, as well as uh, environmental impact reporting it improves discipline it improves um, um, as essentially record keeping as well as benchmarking against policy goals or corporate objectives the actual facts because whoever is shooting green bonds needs to at the end um, sort of report to investors the um, the actual impact and i think that is something that uh, we as an issuer take very very seriously um, we recommend that regulators as well as other issuers take it very very seriously because it's of reputation uh, you know sort of nature but also very very important to the um, to the to the to the world um, to the globe um, given that it serves a very important objective of reducing uh, pollution and emissions um, so i think uh, there's a, a a long journey that hungary has uh, started um, Last year, we will continue, um, and and obviously we are very keen to explore um, new markets um, in on you know on this journey. So I think uh, with that, I would uh, um, I would say thank you to um, uh, to everyone uh, for the attention. So thank you very much for all of you. It was very interesting. We could continue for for hours this talk, and I think and I hope that we will have the opportunity in person soon. Thank you for the opportunity to have you here. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonai. This was indeed a thought-provoking discussion. Thank you to you and the panelists. We have reached the end of our first panel today. We have a short break coming up, but I encourage you to stay close to the screens as our breaks feature excellent videos introducing our initiatives in our city. After the break, we will come back with a panel discussion with Central Bank Digital Currency and the ECNY as the central topics. Our distinguished panelists will address the most crucial aspects of the future of money and the evolution of the monetary system. Stay with us for deeper insight on the money in the era of digitalization. Geopolitics, History, Economics. The book titled American Empire vs. European Dream by Gerd Matolci, the governor of the Central Bank of Hungary, has been released. Providing a broad perspective, it analyzes the process of how the American Empire became the world's number one superpower, what motivations other major players in geopolitics had, how the European Union attempted to compensate the hegemon status of the American Empire, and how the European dream shattered at the dawn of a new world order. You can find the answers to these questions, as well as many important and topical issues, in Gyurgy Matolci's new book, which has already achieved international success. The book is available in bookstores or online, in the web shop of Paulos Atene Publishing House, or on Amazon.com.
thank you staying with us at the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference and warm welcome for those who have just joined in. The forum continues with its second session titled, What Could Be the Money of the Future? What Could Be the Future of Money We Like? Central Bank Digital Currency and ECNY as the next step in the evolution of the monetary system. Joining me on stage is the moderator of the session, Ms. Aniko Sombati, Executive Director and Chief Digital Officer of Magyar Nemzeti Bank. At the Central Bank, Ms. Sombati is responsible for digitalization and fintech development. Her main responsibility is to promote digital transformation in the financial sector as well as within the Central Bank, including the implementation of cutting-edge technologies. She is also a member of the Financial Stability Board. Ms. Sombati, welcome. Uh, digitalization has been a major trend in recent years, which was only further accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, the financial system is no exception. What do you think? What could the future of money be like? Could central bank digital currency and its most renowned emanation, the ECNY, be the next step in the evolution of the money? Well, <clears throat> money has always been an ever-changing concept through history. However, the 21st century has brought about uh, revolutionary changes. Just like in the uh, field of social interactions, where the internet has changed our life for good, finance and money, as we perceive it today, uh, is also about to change due to technological innovation. So, uh, just uh, as hard for us to imagine to pay with bets. It is just as hard for previous generations to imagine transferring value via the top of a screen. So uh, for a central bank, the uh, time has come uh, to lead the change in the field of the innovation of money. Um, just uh, following the trauma of the COVID-19, all international financial market players are carefully watching central banks and wondering what the next step in the evolution of money can be. Uh, central bank digital currencies can provide a comprehensive answer to these questions. Well, thank you. That is definitely something worth discussing further. So I give the floor to you and the participants of the next session. I would like to warmly welcome our second keynote speaker, Mr. Mu Chan Chun. Those who wouldn't know him, I would like to introduce him briefly. So, Mr. Chan Chun Mu is the Director General of the Digital Currency Institute of the People's Bank of China who will discuss the CDBC project of the People Banks of China and the introduction of the ECNY into the already extensively digital retail payment market in China. Mr. Mu joined the People's Bank of China in 1995, where he worked for the International Department and his responsibilities covered multilateral and bilateral cooperation and coordination with international organizations and foreign central banks. Between 2010 and 2020, he served as assistant to the governor, deputy director general of the executive office, and deputy director general of the payment and settlement department, among others. Mr. Mu is a member of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructures, the BIS Financial Innovation Network, and the IMF High Level Advisory Group on Finance and Technology. He was appointed Director General of the Digital Currency Institute in 2019. Mr. Mu, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ms. Zambari. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to the audience. Uh, I'm happy to be here to share our experience or the update our uh, ECNY project. Um, in 2014, 
the PBC set up a tax force to study digital fiat currency. In 2016, the PBC established our digital fiat, the digital currency institute. This year in July, the work, working group on East and Wide research and development of PBC published the very first East and Wide white paper, namely the progress of research and development of East and Wide in China. Division or the first driver is to provide a backup or a redundancy for the retail payment system. Uh, as you may know, we have two big giants in the retail payment service market. One is Alipay, the other one is uh, Tenpay. Uh, people now, the Chinese people now going uh, are going out without their physical wallets or paper notes. Uh, they only bring their uh, mobile phones without even credit cards or debit cards with them. So the um, Alipay and Tenpay has already become the most significant re retail payment service infrastructure. So if there is something bad, bad to happen to them, either financially or technically, uh, people got very huge negative impact. And this financial stability definitely will get huge de negative impact. So if we want to, because we want to safeguard our uh, financial stability, so we have to provide a backup or redundancy for the retail, pay retail payment system. So that's why we started our ECNY project. The second motivation or second driver is to improve the financial inclusion. A lot of people in China, in the remote area or poor area, poor area, they don't even have a commercial bank account. Without a uh, commercial bank account, those people cannot enjoy any basic financial services. So in order to improve the financial inclusion, we, the central bank, have to step up and to have a CBDC uh, project in place to help those people who don't have any commercial bank account to have the could enjoy the basic financial uh, financial services. So to provide the ser financial services to those on the band people in the remote area and the poor area, poor area. The third motivation or the third driver is to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system with a wider access and stronger capacity. In recent years, it has been a trend for the, for the uh, central banks in different jurisdictions to improve the efficiency of the central bank payment system by uh, enlarge the participation or uh, it extend service hours. Uh, in order to improve our central bank payment system with a stronger capacity and also uh, extend the service hours, we should have an ECNY system in place to make those things happen. So that those are the three drivers or motivations uh, behind the uh, ECNY project. So uh, with the uh, first uh, ECNY white paper, uh, people could read the uh, definition of the ECNY, uh, which is the digital version of fiat currency issued by the PBC and operated by authorized operators. It's a value-based, quasi-account-based, and account-based hybrid payments instrument with legal tender status and uh, loosely coupled account linkage. So from the definition, we could summarize several characteristics of the ECNY system. Firstly, uh, is the, the ECNY, from the definition we can see the ECNY is a legal tender. So, and also we have a two-tier system that is 
the PPC will issue ECNY to the second tier, which are the authorized operators. And those op authorized operators will uh, issue or exchange ECNY to the general public and then also handle all those process, all those uh, retail transactions among the uh, general public and uh, enterprises. Though this is uh, a two tier system. Thirdly, the the third app characteristic is uh, uh, ECNY is mainly positioned, mainly positioned as uh, M0. And the, th the last one, the last but not least one is the, managed, the characteristic of managed anonymity. So the four characteristics of the ECNY actually address several uh, concerns by the general public. Firstly is to uh, address the concern of access to the central bank money. The issuance, because the ECNY is a legal tender, so the issuance and circulation of ECNY is identical with the physical RMB, while the value is transferred in a digital form. ECNY is a claim on the central bank backed by the sovereign credit. It has the status of legal tender. So it's the mandate of the central bank to ensure the public direct access to central bank money and make sure the unit of account is consistent in the era of digital economy by digitalizing cash. And the ECNY system will make financial services more accessible, providing fair currency for large population in various scenarios. So with the introduction of the ECNY, the, we will not lose, the people or the general public will not lose the access to the central bank money uh, in the digital era. So that's the first concern we address. Um, the second concern is level playing field. Because our ECNY is provided with, with a two-tier model or two-tier system, so the ECNY will provide the public with a new interoperable way of payment, which will further diversify payment instruments and make, make the payment system more efficient and safer. And with the introduction of ECNY, we could break the barrier of institution or the barrier of platform or barrier of ins payment instruments. And uh, in the di di digital retail payment system, ECNY and funds in the electronic account of authorized operators are interoperable and both constitute cash in circulation. So the all the uh, commercial banks and licensed to non-bank payments to institutions that meet the compliance requirements and regulatory requirements regarding risk management, risk management on a comprehensive and ongoing basis may participate in the ECNY payment system as per recognition and support of the uh, central bank. So that means everybody or every, every institution could participate in the ECNY ecosystem. So, and in, in, also in the ECNY ecosystem, we are following the principle of same business, same risk, same regulation. So a level, level playing field could be provided to the payment market. So that's the second uh, concern we are trying to address. The third one is financial disintermediation. A lot of concerns about uh, financial disintermediation with the introduction of the, the CBDC. Uh, but our ECNY system is to, uh, we are trying to use the ECNY system to reduce the competition uh, with the, the bank deposits uh, may brought by the introduction of CBDC. So our system or ECNY is mainly positioned as M0 and pay no, pay, pays no interest. It's circular in the same way as the physical RMB in a two-tier system under which the commercial bank process ECNY transactions for the public. So the, uh, the commercial banks will not lose the contact with the general public. Meanwhile, uh, the PPC has put in place system fractions such as, um, uh, you know, uh, pay no interest 
and the different categories of uh, uh, digital wallets and uh, uh, promote the ECNY in retail payment use cases. So, and also we, uh, we have different caps on transactions and balances for different categories of ECNY wallets. With all those uh, measures, to address the compliance, the institutional design of ECNY system strictly comply with uh, regulations on the administration of RMB, anti-money laundering and counter financing of terrorism, the, also the administration of foreign exchange and the data privacy protection. And the operation of ECNY will be included in the regulatory framework. That's all because the ECNY is positioned at M0. We have to comply with all the regulations in place uh, uh, of M0. The last one but not least is the uh, privacy protection. Uh, without the third party and anonymity, financial transactions may jeopardize personal data and privacy. But a complete third party Anonymity may encourage criminal activities such as tax invasion, ter terrorist financing, and money laundering. The skills are tipped by collecting every piece of uh, information, personal information, to keep compliance. For example, the Chinese commercial banks are required to collect and process area of personal data on individuals during the onboarding process uh, or before engaging in certain business transactions with them in the traditional e-banking system. But the ECNY uh, system attains a similar function of currency to cash uh, uh, and uh, be used in a managed, managed on, on an anonymous basis. So it, we, we adopted a way to strike a balance between protect the pri person's privacy and combating illicit transactions. Uh, so we are trying to keep the degree of the anonymity within a managed level. And following uh, those uh, uh, principles, uh, the PPC has launched the ECNY pilots in Shenzhen, Suzhou, Xi'an, Chengdu, in the areas of 2022 when Be Beijing Winter Olympics. Since the end of uh, 2019, uh, starting from November 2020, Shanghai, Hainan, Changsha, Xi'an, Qingdao, and Dalian joined pilot. The uh, selections of uh, pilot areas for ECNY R&D project take into account of, of uh, factors such as major national development strategies, coordinated regional development strategies, as well as city-specific uh, industrial and economic features. Um, the pilot program now spans the Yangtze River Delta, the Pearl River Delta, the Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei region, and the Chinese central, western, north, northern, uh, northeastern, and northwestern regions. A wide range of pilot places is conducive to testing and assessing the application of ECNY in different parts of China. As of September 10, 2021, ECNY has been applied in over 2.05 million use cases, covering utility payment, catering services, transportation, shopping, and the government services. More than 17. 3.1 million personal or individual wallets and over 6.13 million corporate wallets have been opened with transaction volume totaling 112.93 million and uh, transactions value uh, pro approximating RMB 48.73 billion. Well, we, as uh, you see, uh, our ECNY is mainly positioned at M0, so we mainly focus in the domestic retail market. Uh, but, but, but at the same time, uh, 
uh, the ECNY could also be used uh, in the cross-border uh, use cases. Uh, although we uh, we are trying to focus in the domestic market, but if in some day the ECNY could be used in the cross-border use cases, we propose to have three principles or rules will be applied in that in the cross-border use cases. So there are a lot of concerns of uh, you know about the cross-border use cases of CBDCs. And uh, among those, uh, uh, the uh, including currency substitution, weakened capital control, or privacy issues. So we propose those three principles to address those concerns. We Chinese have an old saying that don't do unto others what you don't want others to do unto you. So we propose that first rule or first principle of use ECNY or de deploy ECNY in the cross-border uh, scenario is uh, no disruption. The CBDC or ECNY supplied by the central bank or by, by the PBC should continue supporting the healthy evolution and the financial stability of the international monetary system. The CBDC supplied by, by one central bank should not impede other central banks' ability to carry out its mandate for monetary and financial stability. So this principle could be uh, a, you know, realized by our system design, like um, M0 position, two-tier system, and also the conversion mechanism in place. The second uh, rule or second principle is compliance. The cross-border payments arrangements with CBDC should comply with the regulations and laws of jurisdiction concerned, such as capital management, foreign exchange mechanism, information flow and fund flow could be synchronized so as to facilitate the regulators to monitor the transactions for compliance. The arrangements with CBDC should improve the transparency in cross-border e-commerce and helps to address the regulatory pain points in AML, safety, custom, and tax declaration, and capital management, etc. For example, the ECNY service has to comply with GDPR if we extend the service to the European citizens. As a result, this ECNY service may not be available before the PPC and the ECB or the local uh, uh, central bank uh, in the counterparty uh, of the counterparty jurisdiction could reach a consensus on the CBDC cross-border payment cooperation mechanism. And that's the second uh, principle. The third principle is interoperability. Interoperability should be enabled between CBDC system of different jurisdictions and the conversion of CBDC could be processed at the virtual border of digital wallets. A scalable and overseen trade, foreign exchange trade platform supported by DLT could be established. It will support the currency conversion for the banking, for the banks participating in the initiative. The conversion between CBDC of different jurisdictions could address the concerns of currency substitution and capital control. So those are the principles we we'll like to comply, we we'll like to apply to the ECNY in the future's uh, cross-border use cases. Well, uh, people may get confused when we we'll talk about the conversion mechanism on the virtual border between digital wallets uh, of different jurisdictions. I can give you an example. For example, if you if mainland China tourists travel traveling to Hong Kong, um, once he or she get off the flight, then he or she will like, call a cab, and uh, the, when the when they arrive at the destination, uh, the Chinese the mainland Chinese uh, 
tourist will like to pay in ECNY to the chauffeur of that cab. But that chauffeur will not receive the, the payment in ECNY, but he or she, the chauffeur will receive, receive in Hong Kong dollars, in e electronic Hong Kong dollars, in his uh, uh, commercial bank account. That conversion between the two wallets will happen on the virtual border of the two between the two wallets. So if with the conversion mechanism on the virtual border of the digital wallets, that will prevent or uh, you know to uh, uh, will will prevent the sub currency substitution or the capital control uh, problems. So that will keep will protect the monetary sovereignty of each jurisdiction, and we don't have any spillover because we use ECNY or other CBDC in the cross-border uh, scenario. And uh, also, uh, we have a lot of in international efforts to uh, solve the uh, cross-border payment trilemma which are the uh, transparency, cost, and uh, efficiency problems. Among those efforts, uh, the multiple CBDC or MCBDC bridge is one of, uh, is part of that effort. Uh, the MCBDC bridge is a CBDC core creation project X, under the guidelines of BS uh, Innovation Hub in Hong Kong to explore the cap capac capabilities of DLT and study the application with CBDC in enhancing financial infrastructure to support multiple multi-currency cross-border payments. The project first initiated bilaterally by Hong Kong MA and Bank of Thailand under the name of Ethanol Landrock was renamed CBDC Bridge when the Innovation Hub, the BBS Innovation Hub, and the Digital Currency Institute of the People's Bank of China and the Central Bank of UAB joined. The project explored the use of CBDC to tackle pinpoints in cross-border fund transfer, such as inefficiencies, high costs, low transparency, and the complexities related to achieving regulatory compliance. That platform also developed a working prototype to support the instant, instant cross-border payment versus payment, which is PVP in multiple currencies among multiple jurisdictions, which will allow the participating central banks to explore the capabilities and the key design challenges of DLT in the contest. The project includes exploration of scalability, interoperability, privacy, and governance. governance. The theory is always dry and boring. So before I uh, end my presentation, I would like to show you a video clip about our ECNY system to, uh, you know, uh, to let you know the future of ECNY system. So please enjoy the video. Sorry, we don't translate uh, the video into English because we mainly focus in the retail, domestic retail market. Hopefully, yeah. in the future, the dog could be as smart as the ECNY and it could be used in a lot of uh, use cases. And we are happy to share our experience and lessons learned from the trials. Hope this will help those central banks in their own CBDC project. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for this very, very insightful presentation and especially elaborating on an MCBDC project in which we are quite much uh, interested. But uh, l let me refer back to to the uh, basics of uh, the idea of CBDC and, NC and uh, CNY. So uh, money is primarily a social contract. Uh, therefore, uh, this uh, new version of money requires the support of all stakeholders. So what was your experience during the pilot introduction? How the shareholders uh, received the, EC, the stakeholders received the ECMY. They are happy to have an, an alternative uh, payment instruments in place. They have a, one more choice for them to make their retail payments. And for the uh, merchants uh, and also for the uh, authorized operators or other uh, the ecosystem, ecosystem participants, uh, they are also very happy to have this CNC web uh, system in place because, as I mentioned, that uh, we mainly positioned as uh, M0. That means the central bank will not charge any fees from the central, from the commercial bank or the PSPs or the other participants. So, and also we're not we're not going to charge any fee from the uh, end users, and the individuals, or the enterprises. So the cost will dramatically will be lower com comparing with uh, to the tra traditional uh, electronic payment instruments. Although the authorized operators and the PSPs, they will they they could charge from the merchants, so they could earn profit by providing ECNY uh, uh, services to the individuals and uh, merchants and other uh, sectors of the society. So for them, they are incentivized to provide the ECNY uh, services. And for the end users, their cost and the, the, the merchants, for the merchants, their costs have been dramatically lower uh, than before. So the ECNY is quite welcome by the whole society. Uh, furthermore, because we could provide a programmability uh, from the ECNY project, so the more functionality could be supplied or provided to the society. That means for the whole society, people are very excited to have more functions in their daily payment transactions. And uh, the more participants, more industry participant, participants could also benefited from the functionalities uh, provided by the ECNY system. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, as, as I can uh, conclude, the ECNY will uh, offer uh, convenience, uh, favorable prices, and, and uh, many more new functionalities. So the uh, Beijing Winter Olympics is coming up soon and you have uh, very ambition, ambitious plans in respect of ECMY usage during the Olympics. So how the development is uh, going on and what can our athletes and the Hungarian visitors expect uh, when uh, they arrive there? We are ha very happy to have all those uh, foreign guests to, to uh, Beijing and also to join this uh, Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, as I mentioned, uh, for the foreigners or the non-residents, uh, the most uh, most concern is about privacy issues. So, uh, as I mentioned, we provided a management anonymity function to the all the users, including the foreign, uh, the non-residents uh, who will travel to China in a very short time. For those people, for those non-residents or foreign friends, you, because uh, you don't have any commercial accounts uh, in mainland China, so it's not possible uh, before to uh, enjoy the mobile payment services provided by those big giants. But with ECNY, 
all the non-residents could open uh, digital wallets uh, without uh, support or without a commercial bank open in Chinese banks. And then you can uh, exchange uh, your money from the Visa card or MasterCard or, or debit card to the uh, digital wallets of uh, East and Y. But for those people who are concerned about the uh, apps, uh, privacy issues, they can use the uh, uh, the uh, IC cards or visible cards or e-ink cards we provided, we will provide during the Winter Olympics. And uh, we have already, uh, the, the authorized arbiters would open different types of digital wallets for their customers based on the strengths of KYC and uh, set per transaction of daily caps as well as uh, daily uh, balance cap according to the strengths of KYC. So the uh, foreign residents could open a digital wallet without a bank banking account and also only with their mobile number. And the mobile number will, well, the identity will not be revealed to the Central Bank of China or the authorized of uh, East and Y system. So all the pr least uh, privileged uh, digital wallet uh, identity will be kept in a very, very you know, uh, anonymous uh, basis, basis. And recently, we also adopted a personal information protection law which will come in into effect on 1st of November 2021, well, they will further strengthen the protection of personal privacy in the ECNY system. So from that law, with that law, the telecom operators are forbidden to reveal any real identity information behind the mobile number to PPC or authorized operators. That means the privacy of the anonymous uh, data, uh, anon anonymous data, uh, wallet holder will be well protected. And secondly, we have established a strict, uh, very strict data management mechanism. The uh, authorized operators will perform KYC responsibilities and store their own data locally. That the authorized operators in the central bank do not provide information to third parties or other or other government agencies unless stipulated otherwise in law and regulations. And internally, the PBC will set up an information firewall and strictly implements information security and privacy protocols, such as appointing responsible persons for maintenance, establishing business China wall, applying a tiered authorization system, putting in place checks and balances, Deploying technology such as zero knowledge proofs and secure multiple, multi-party computation, and conducting internal audits. So uh, any arbitrary information requests or use are pro prohibited. So the information of those foreign citizens uh, uh, in the ECNY system were well protected. So uh, I believe. Uh, we can provide a variety of product, payment info products or ECNY while pro providing a well-protected uh, personal privacy mechanism in place. So we welcome all the friends from all over the world during the Beijing Ol Winter Olympics. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invaluable contribution today and even covering the latest development. And I, I do hope that our cooperation will continue successfully in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would uh, like to greet uh, our panel members and uh, let me introduce them first. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to introduce Ms. Uh, Yanyu Wang, uh, who is the general manager of the China Construction Bank as a Hungary branch. Ms. Wang joined China Construction Bank in 1988 and has more than 30 years of extensive experience in banking operation and management. 
before leading the team to carry out preparatory work for the CCB Hungary from last year, Ms. Wang, Head Officer's Deputy General Manager in CCB Paris branch, Head of Corporate Banking in CCB Toronto branch, and Senior Product Manager and Deputy Chief Manager of Huan branch, International Business Department. As a second, I would like to introduce Mr. Lian Cheng, who is the Deputy Director of the Research Center for Payment and Settlements at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, CASS, and Head of Department of Fundamental Research at the Institute of Finance and Banking, CASS. He is also Executive Deputy Editor-in-Chief of the journal called Chinese Review of Financial Studies and author of several papers and articles. Professor Chang organized many major research projects contributing to related authorities' policymaking. His academic interests focus on payment system, fintech, international monetary system, and economic geography. And last but not least, I would like to introduce Mr. Binov, Binur Zhalenov, who is the technology advisor to the governor and chairman of the board at the Payment and Financial Technology Development Center of the National Bank of Kazakhstan. As technology advisor to the governor, Mr. Zhalanov has led the development of the strategic roadmap for fintech and innovation in the Republic of Kazakhstan 2020-2025, designed the decision-making framework for digital transformation and established the Office of Digital Transformation at the National Bank of Kazakhstan. Mr. Zelenov is also responsible for, for the research of a retail a central bank digital currency implementation, the digital tenge, uh, in the Republic of uh, Kazakhstan. So I would like to uh, greet you all. And first, I would like to turn to Ms. Wang, who is representing one of the major commercial banks from China and, and uh, the ECNY, the Central Bank Digital Currency, creates a whole new landscape for commercial banks. Can con commercial banks adapt and do even better in a CBDC-based system? In what way the commercial banks still cr can create value for their customers if the transactions are facilitated by uh, CBDC? How can you describe the business model of commercial banks in the new system? Ms. Wang, the floor is yours. Yes. Good morning uh, and good afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Uh, somebody. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, uh, it's my honor to have this chance to attend uh, this high-level conference. Uh, to begin, please allow me to introduce uh, the Chinese CBDC ECNY pilot and the promotion in China Construction Bank. CCB was among the first to uh, engage uh, the development and the testing project of the digital fiat currency ECNY and steadily carried carry forward the development and the pilots of the ECNY under the overall guidance of the PBC. The bank uh, has interactively developed CCB ECNY system and the ECNY wallet system to effectively provide ECNY exchange and the circulation services. It actively engaged in ECNY pilots in Shenzhen, Suzhou, Xiong'an, and other areas, and creates many scenarios such as convenient payments for payrolls taxes, medical fees, and tickets for the use of ECNY. As of the end of June, CCB has extended the use of ECNY to various scenarios, including fee payments for utilities, catering services, transportation, shopping, education, and government services. More than, than 7.23 million personal wallets and over one point. 1.9 million corporate wallets has been opened, with over 28.45 million transactions and a total amount approximating 
18.9 billion yuan. So uh, from our bank's experience, we can see as a participant in the uh, CBDC, um, uh, commercial banks will have three uh, opportunities regarding uh, their account system, payment system, cash transaction, cross-border settlement, and even anti-money laundering. Firstly, uh, the CBDC will reduce the cost of uh, processing of uh, political of, sorry, of uh, physical currency in commercial banks. And secondly, the CBDC will optimize the business operation of commercial banks and promote the transformation and operating of commercial banks. In the long run, in order to cope with this big change, commercial banks need to carry out all round innovation, which will help to expand their business transformation and operating. Thirdly, the CBDC will accelerate the transition between cash and the deposits. People tend to convert CBDC into bank deposits or other financial products, which increase their AUM in commercial banks. So commercial banks can seize the opportunity to make full use of cutting edge technologies such as big data, artificial intelligence, cloud and computing, etc. to provide a more accurate and uh, convenient service to clients, optimize operation process and the risk control, further develop business innovation actively to structure a multi-level and all-around digital operation system successfully. As just like uh, Mr. Mu mentioned, uh, in recent years, the rapid development of mobile payment has provided the public with convenience and uh, efficiency uh, in the retail payment service. Meanwhile, a safer, more interoperable and more inclusive retail payment infrastructure need to be in place. So CBDC can meet the diversified payment needs while the value is transferred in digital form. It has intrinsic value characteristics and uh, legal tender status. Under the new system, CBDC's promotion and widespread use will take the place of mobile payment service to a great ex extent. As the authorized operator, a commercial bank will be able to expand the retail and the corporate payment models. The smart contract to CB of CBDC has the characteristic of anti-external interference and the automatic execution when conditions are met, which could help commercial banks to reach a wider range of business. For example, uh, more accurate agency payments uh, for the government financial funds and the corporation money operations. So for the client, CBDC has the digital wallet system that is directly established in by user, by, by sorry, by the issuer and that does not rely existing deposit account for direct settlement uh, during a transaction, thereby realizing the function of settlement upon payment and the greatly reduce the transaction and the circulation costs, which benefits the client a lot. Uh, for large corporates, the commercial bank can further provide support to the financial management uh, by replacing one-to-many money transfer, parent wallet plus sub-wallet solution can help the corporate clients to, to achieve more front funds allocation and the enhanced cash management, which could improve the efficiency of financial management. Uh, according to uh, uh, CCB, our bank's practice, we uh, innovated uh, their application models to cooperate with e-commerce platforms such as uh, Jindong and uh, e.ccb.com, as well as the investment and the wealth management uh, institutions such as Tiantian Fund to enable um, the online payment and the uh, services scenarios. Uh, it, it expanded offline scenario to enable uh, CD, CBDC payments via 
near field communication and hardware wallets in the environment without network coverage. This is a good example of the business model uh, development. So uh, uh, our bank also will uh, continue to steadily push forward the pilot project and development of ECMY under the guidance of PBOC, explore new technologies and deepen the application of smart uh, contracts, hardware wallets and durable offline payments and further expand the coverage of application scenario to achieve full coverage in the pilot region. This is my uh, sharing. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have had a, a wide variety of use, use cases from uh, retail and, and uh, uh, commercial fields as well. So it seems that uh, CCB is really uh, deeply involved in the project. Now I would like to turn to Mr. Lion Chang and uh, ask him that uh, uh, since uh, the beginning of the development and testing uh, uh, period, uh, the, uh, there, are, there could be a lot of uh, empirical experiences and what are the major ones uh, uh, in terms of economic and social perspective. The floor is yours, Mr. Cheng. Okay, thank you, Mr. Badi. I think maybe the most uh, important and the major uh, result of those uh, experiments and uh, below the projects are that uh, Chinese people and uh, commercial institutions have no problem to accept uh, the CBDC, such as the ECMY. And actually, this is uh, an, a very natural result because, as we know, China has a very advanced and popular third payment system. And so uh, people are used to non cash payments. And also, the design of the ECNY is quite like those payment system. And the, the process of using the ECNY is no significant different from the major third payment uh, uh, system, such as the Alipay or the WeChat. So, Chinese people are quite familiar with this system and they are quite natural to get accepted it. And actually, Chinese people are not only familiar with this kind of the payment system, but also familiar with the promotion strategies. Yeah, as you know, that uh, in the experience in some cities, the people, they got some, the, the Chinese says, the Hongbao, the red envelope uh, in their evil rate. That means the CBOC. Uh, store some, for example, 200 yuan in your e-wallet and encourage you to use it. And this is a very common strategy for the third-party payment system to uh, promote uh, their system. They give you some something like the gift card, and so you are induced to use it. You are familiar with the operations, and you are used to it, and you are sticked to it. So Chinese people, we are quite familiar with all this process, and. Yeah, they see. Yeah, it's another thing like those uh, systems, so no problem. And but uh, the negative side of this phenomenon is that people they are familiar with this system, but they take it just as another third party system. They are not take it as the fundamental legal, uh, legal system, uh, legal uh, legal tender system. For example, I read some academic analysis of the, uh, the behavioral patterns of the consumers in this e-wallet, and they are quite similar with those patterns with uh, the third-party system and with the gift card. That means the people, they just use up the balance in the wallet, and then they just get it there. And we do not see the custom loyalty to the e wallet. That's the problem. So I think, yeah, so far the experiments and the pilot project prove that, yeah, it is technology for a physical system, but it still have a very long to go before it reach the target set that the PBOC, as the uh, Mr. Mu Changchun said, become a, a major uh, non cash payment of the PBOC. And that's my opinion. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. So you already referred to the red envelope program and, and all the testings. And uh, so we are very curious about uh, how, how can you just describe how to, how to design a successful testing program? Uh, what are the key considerations in this respect? Um. Actually, to build the customer loyalties and to make it a, a popular system, I think for the Chinese people, they care more about the convenience and the safety, such as they with the, uh, the major third-party payment system, the Alipay or the WeChat state. Why they are so popular? Because they are very convenient. For example, with the uh, WeChat, uh, WeChat payment, WeChat actually is not a, a payment instrument. It actually is a, a social media and a, a community uh, instrument. So when you are talking about with your friend, and sometimes you want to send some money, uh, not actually, it's not sometimes it's not a commercial uh, behavior. It's just to, uh, to show your kindness to your friend. Uh, in Chinese, we call it the red like environment, and it's a very small, uh, small change, uh, small number of uh, the payment, and then you can send it through the WeChat Pay. It is uh, totally integrated with the talking, with the communication instrument, so it is very convenient. That's why people will accept it and use it so frequently. Also, the safety. Actually, besides the Alipay and the and the, the Tencent Pay, the WeChat, we have also some other third part payments, but they are not so popular. And some they are just exist the market. Why? Because they are not so safe. Sometimes you just store some values, and now it's prohibited. But in the let me say in the two thousand and thirteen around that time, that is still permission. You store some money in your wallet, and you use the, this payment system to yeah to transfer money. And for sometimes you found oh, the bank the uh, the the corporation they just bankrupt, and the, all the money in your wallet they are gone. So people then they were with this dangerous. Like this, not all the third party corporations they are safe. So the turn to the large and they think prominent third party payments. That's why we have only two major third party payments, that is the Alipay and the WeChat Pay. So I think that is very important for the PBOC. Although PBOC, they are official, so people will see they are so official and so they have the, the promo, uh, they have the pretty dress, um, officials and they have the very strong system so they can promote. Uh, prove the safety of the payment, and uh, they can uh, prove the uh, they got the, uh, the the soundness of the system. But uh, actually, this is in question. Why? Because for the Alipay and the WeChat Pay, they have a huge investment in their system. That is the basic uh, ground for the safety, for the convenience. But for the PBOC, that is still a question. Could you? Uh, could them put such huge money into this system because so far in the experiments, in the project, uh, in the pilot project, the uh, instrument are not from the PBOC, but from their partners in the experiments, such as from the Jingdong or from the Tenxin. So people still question this. Uh, they are thought, uh, can PBOC really have the budget for so large, so complex uh, uh, payment system. So I think this is the problem. And uh, also some people they think that the uh, uh, advantage of the CNY is that uh, they can keep your anonymity. They think uh, this is a quite good side. Yeah, it's quite good. But for the Chinese customers, I don't think it's a really a competition advantage because uh, as I said, most people they care about convenience, they care about safety. So the anonymity is not so important, although it may be important at, uh, and uh, maybe at the uh, elite system, uh, elite uh, levels, for example, for the prof, uh, for the commercial institutions, 
they are important. But for the common people, we don't quite care about that. So I think the most thing for the PBO state to promote the ECNY is make it convenient and make it safe. And that depends on how much you want to invest in the system. That's my opinion. Uh, thank you very much. So now I would like to turn to Mr. Zelenov. And uh, so we see that the concept of CBDC has also attracted the interest of the National Bank of Kazakhstan. So what are the main aspects of your motivation? And uh, to what challenges can digital tenge be the solution? Uh, first of all, let me appreciate you for inviting us, uh, me, for today's conference. It's uh, quite insightful, uh, as previous uh, speakers already told. Well, uh, CBDC topic for Kazakhstan uh, is part of the biggest story of uh, whole national payment system modernization. So, uh, as uh, our colleagues from other central banks already mentioned, we do observe the trend uh, on the financial market uh, to uh, developing the closed ecosystems, which creates this closed loop for customers, so that they, uh, so that the competition on the financial market, especially in payment industry, uh, being locked up by the, uh, by that uh, closed ecosystems. So therefore, uh, we have uh, several initiatives to uh, support uh, and foster competition on the financial market through different, you know, uh, methods and actions. And uh, one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, CBDC research motivation is fostering competition through uh, providing um, the new infrastructure for financial institutions so that they can create uh, new financial services uh, and uh, increase the supply of services on the financial market. Uh, the uh, second part, of course, uh, very important, it is uh, financial inclusion especially when we're talking about cashless society. Uh, we have a pretty good number of in Kazakhstan. The, I believe about 64% of the whole transactions are cashless as for now. But still we have certain challenges, especially uh, in uh, regions far from uh, big cities. We still have uh, a huge amount, a uh, huge share of uh, cash transactions. Uh, and we believe that certain aspects of digital tenge, especially uh, uh, enabling offline payments through uh, digital tenge, uh, will help to increase financial inclusion and increase uh, uh, share of cashless transactions in those uh, regions. Uh, and of course, um, uh, we believe that uh, it might be helpful, but still working on this research for uh, several monetary policy goals uh, because there might be synergy with some of the um, methods that we use uh, to uh, actually um, do monetary policy, but it's still uh, to be researched uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, and long story short, that's uh, probably the core motivations as for now, but we're still uh, testing different hypotheses how uh, the technology can be helpful of other potential uh, motivations. Uh, thank you very much. So I would like to, to mention one other uh, angle of, of the prospective uh, uh, benefits of CBDC is uh, cross-border transactions. And uh, so how do you see uh, the role of regional and international cooperation and what uh, role they can play in the development of digital tenge? Yeah, of course, thank you for the question. Uh, Cross-border transactions is uh, probably one of the key pains in international trade when we're talking about uh, our region, especially Central Asia, Russian Federation is our key uh, trade partner. There are a number of solutions that might be used to, uh, you know, to fight that problem, including CBDC. And uh, now we also are working on potential integration between fast payment systems with certain trade partners, which is also might be helpful. But uh, when we're talking about CBDC, the cooperation is critical because uh, we, uh, we do observe several initiatives conducted by BIS, uh, by our colleagues from uh, China, 
uh, we saw the uh, proof of concept between Project Jasper and Project Yubin. Of course, it is critical, and mostly uh, those initiatives uh, targets um, a technological uh, part of these uh, CBDC uh, cross-border story, proof of concept, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we believe that uh, the uh, most challenging part would be related to these regulatory challenges and uh, how we would frame uh, those two things. Uh, we actually work in with several uh, trade partners in our region uh, to potentially integrate uh, two platform, uh, CBDC platforms, so that it can reduce these cross-border fees. Uh, but again, a uh, number of questions needs to be solved before we can move further with you know, technological integration. So for example, uh, we're now considering, uh, we believe that CBDC, uh, cross-border CBDC is closely related to the topic of uh, identification, of digital identification. Um, and uh, digital identification infrastructures of uh, trade partners should also be, in a sense, integrated. Uh, and um, this is also a topic that uh, needs to be solved. Uh, but again, and also we have other alternatives to improve cross-border payments, uh, including probably regional stable coins or stable coins related to other uh, assets. Uh, but yeah, my belief that uh, cross-border transactions enabled by CBDC probably would be the next step after the uh, largest economies in the world would uh, decide uh, on the, um, and central bank community in the world would decide on interoperability standards. How would uh, this interoperability would be uh, enabled in different kinds of uh, CBDC designs. Uh, thank you. So by referring to standards, you already uh, are endeavored into the field of uh, field of technology. And uh, here I would like to ask uh, your opinion on uh, the role of distributed ledger technology in the field of uh, CBDC operation. So what do you think? Uh, what kind of benefits could it have with respect to other solutions? Yeah, mm, again, this is a uh, complex uh, question, uh, consistent of, of several parts. So, uh, first of all, uh, we believe that uh, CBDC should solve some uh, political objective of certain central bank. Uh, depending on that different objective, different uh, kinds of technology and different models uh, would be the most helpful. Uh, I can talk about Kazakhstan a bit here. Uh, we believe that uh, given uh, policy objectives that we hypothesize could be solved by CBDC, uh, we believe that combination and hybrid model of conventional technology and distributed ledger might be helpful. Particularly, distributed ledger, uh, in our opinion, is more uh, resilient to potential uh, cyber attacks, uh, and uh, it is more safe in that sense. Uh, but again, uh, distributed ledger technology uh, domain is quite wide. It really depends how we can use that. We now, uh, during our pilot and proof of concept, see certain limits of using uh, distributed ledger technology uh, related to transaction processing, um, uh, uh, anonymity questions, et cetera, et cetera. Those are technology trade-offs that needs to be solved in the future I don't think that there are existing effective solutions uh, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, build uh, the ideal solution based entirely uh, on DLT technology. Even though there are certainly a lot of uh, vendors and a lot of platforms uh, that uh, can solve many of that problems. Uh, but when we talk about the real world, uh, a lot of um, uh, troubles could arise with DLT uh, related to processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I believe that uh, uh, this uh, type of technology uh, will develop, certainly, given that uh, central banks in the world have in demand uh, to uh, develop uh, this kind of technology. It certainly also 
um, enables other important aspects of payment system uh, programmability, um, verification of tokens, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, we have to understand that, that in my opinion, most of these uh, most of these opportunities that is provided by uh, contemporary DLT platforms uh, fundamentally can be provided by centralized technology as well. So uh, here it is important to see. Uh, what objects we would solve? Develop DLT technology domain or solve a central bank, uh, you know, policy objective uh, and central bank policy problems. So, so uh, but my belief that within the reasonable period of time, the maturity of DLT platforms and DLT technologies would increase so that all of the problems that we encounter now uh, would be solved. Uh, and we can really t take advantage uh, of fundamental characteristics of DLT systems, which is uh, higher resiliency, uh, higher cybersecurity, and, uh, um, uh, and the programmability of tokens, if I may say. So that's, thank you, uh, thank you very much. So now I would like to turn again to Ms. Wang and refer to the ECNY project. And uh, so, uh, since uh, China uh, has already uh, uh, really developed the digital retail market, a special, uh, special problem can arise uh, with the widespread use of uh, digital money, uh, which is uh, how real financial inclusion can be achieved. So how some social groups such as elderly, less educated and uh, disadvantaged people uh, can be accessed and how can you offer them a CDB solution that is secure, accessible and easy to use? Uh, I, I, I think your uh, mic is muted. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. So for the safety, uh, firstly, uh, the CBDC follows the principle of uh, anonymity for the small value and uh, uh, traceable for high value and attaches great importance to protecting uh, personal information and privacy to collect uh, less transaction information than traditional digital payment uh, than the traditional uh, digital payment instrument. So meanwhile, in order to protect against the misuse of CBDC in legal and critical activities, such as uh, telefraud, internet gambling, uh, money laundering, and uh, tax evasion, by uh, making use their transactions comply with their uh, ML uh, or CFT requirements, CBDC can also be traceable for high value. Uh, and uh, the commercial banks uh, jointly uh, develop uh, the shared uh, apps on the mobile devices to manage digital wallets and the authentic uh, CBDC based on the technologies like security chips supported by uh, IC cards, mobile phones, wearable uh, objects, and the Internet of Things devices devices. The function of uh, CBDC can be realized. Uh, just uh, also, um, you mentioned for the social, uh, uh, special social groups. So uh, the uh, commercial banks develop uh, wallet ecolog ecological uh, platforms to enable operator specific visual system and the speci special features as well as online and the offline application in all scenarios. This aims to satisfy the different types of uh, demands of different users at different level to ensure that the digital wallets be very inclusive and uh, uh, to try to avoid the obstacle arising from the digital divide. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, I would like to turn to Mr. Chang and uh, asking him about uh, whether the ECNY can be a role model for latecomers in designing a fully operational CDBC framework. 
Yeah, this is a very good question. And uh, yeah, so far, as I mentioned, the, the test of the ECNY is successful, but uh, uh, still, I think this may be uh, a very common problems for all the fintech innovations and for the uh, such uh, such kind of test as the regulatory sandbox. That is the scale of the experiment. Uh, so limited, so that you cannot know the real capacities and you cannot see maybe the disadvantages or the shortcomings of the system. For example, for this, uh, so far, the experiments, in the experiments, the time, the space, the people, and the scenario of using the ECN wire are quite limited. And uh, ask, uh, as uh, Mr. Mu Changchun, mentioned the essential uh, nature of the ECNY is a backup return payment system. But uh, so far this is not tested. As a backup payment system, for example, you want to, it can be work in a very, in some, in some events such as extreme disaster scenarios. For example, in July this year, we got flood in the Henan province and in the cities, we cannot use the uh, third party system because we got we lost Wi Fi. And in that scenario, we want to use the, the official the PBOC, CBOC, such as the ECNY. But we don't know if in that scenario ECNY can work. So I think this is the problem. We, we still need more experience and not the experience in the common scenarios, but in the extreme scenarios to test it is uh, a sound, uh, safe, and uh, it's a feasible uh, legal tender system in such extreme uh, events. And I think that is the direction for the Eastern ally to show its, its power, to show its advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would conclude that uh, the introduction of the uh, full uh, operational widely available CDBC is a long way for all of us and probably we need some more other discussions and other occasions like this uh, where I would also like to welcome you again. So for now I would like to thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sombati, for guiding us through this session. And I also thank the participants for their valuable insights. With closing our second panel, we have reached the end of today's professional program. I hope you all agree with me when I say we had a successful and rewarding day. Our speakers have guided us through the most topical and intriguing questions related to central bank digital currency and the role of RMB in the post-COVID world economy. Despite the difficulties and the challenges of the pandemic, it is truly delightful to see that professionals and decision makers are eagerly working towards a better future and how human wisdom and creativity flourishes for a more effective crisis management. I believe that the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference has successfully highlighted the importance of international dialogue and the enormous value of sharing experiences, knowledge and different points of views from distant countries. As closing of today's program, I would like to invite Mr. Mihai Potoi, Deputy Governor of the Magyar Nemzeti Bank, to deliver some concluding thoughts and major takeaways. Deputy Governor, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the late French Emperor Napoleon had a saying that closing remarks must be short and confusing. So I, I could very much easily comply to these requirements. First of all, I would like to, like yourself said, I would like to thank all the, all the participants, the, the keynote speakers, the, the panelists, the moderators, and, and yourself and the colleagues who have uh, made it possible. As far as the first panel is concerned, 
it became very clear that the international investors and the central banks are very much interested increasing the renminbi reserves in their own uh, jurisdiction and this is why the renminbi reserves and the role of international uh, uh, renminbi is growing in the past couple of years so probably this this whole initiative will be much 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 slower than we anticipated in the past i give you give you a probably like Napoleon asked, a little bit confusing uh, remark, but I hope that, uh, that at the end, eventually, you will understand what I am talking about. <clears throat> so, the dominance of dollar in the, in the last 120 years, or last 100 years, is not just a, a financial issue. It's not just a decision of asset managers or bankers or international traders to use it. This is, this is practically a, a much more, <clears throat> a much, much deeper and a much broader picture which supports the dollar dominance. So, in financial terms, you cannot understand it. A broader thinking is needed. For example, you might not misunderstand, but you know the military expression is who controls the seven seas can have a financial power as well. So it's, again, it's much broader. If you, if you think that what we now experience, this is the, probably a new chapter of globalization. But globalization is very much rooted in capitalism. And capitalism is very much rooted in a Western European American culture, Protestant culture. So, a, and all the, all the thinkers who were contributing in the past couple of hundred years to this capitalist thinking, Adam Smith, Keynes, Friedman, Hayek, they were all building one intellectual empire. And again, it, it must be patient who wants to, who wants to change the the order of the world. So dollar's dominance is not just a financial business. It's a much deeper and much, much uh, broader and much more important issue. This is why I would very much uh, ask everybody who wants to increase the renminbi role in the world to be patient, because unpatient is, is, a, is a bad advisor in this issue. Regarding the second panel, <clears throat> Central bank digital currency is unavoidable. It's uh, definitely the, the digitalization will, uh, will provoke us, central bankers, to deal with this issue. So what I wanted just to point out that digitalization has its risks. And uh, most probably the central bank digital currency has its risk as well. This is normal way of life. So if you allow me uh, in a... In a light note at the end. I would just have a re request to those colleagues all over the world who are working on central bank digital currency, just don't lose the central bank's central role in the monetary and payment system. So I, I hope that you will not uh, innovate a new system where there is no role for central banks. Being a central banker, probably this is a, a legitimate request to you. I believe we should go ahead on this, on this road but definitely, uh, like we have seen with Mr. Moose's uh, experience, that we have this risk. And before we do anything, we have to be very careful to minimize and mitigate these risks. And most of all, we should keep a payment system, a monetary system, with the center being the central bank of the given country. So thank you very much for everybody again. Thank you for the, those who are listening to us. We will continue, and uh, good health to everybody. Next time we see each other, I hope, in person here in Budapest on the next Renbimbi conference. And healthy dinner for, for those who, who will have a dinner, and for, for the European colleagues, a uh, uh, very good lunch. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor, for the concise summary. Thank you very much.
We have reached the end of our conference. Once again, I thank all of our speakers and participants for sharing their great insights and our audience for staying with us till the end. If you missed any of the speeches or you would like to re-watch our sessions, visit the Budapest Renminbi Initiative Conference website or the Magyar Nemzeti Bank's YouTube channel in the upcoming days as all of our sessions will be available on demand soon. In addition, we would be delighted to welcome you at the MMB's next conference, the Budapest Eurasia Forum 2021, to be held online between the 18th and 19th of November. The conference will discuss the most relevant topics in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic with the help of internationally renowned experts and policymakers. Follow the MMB's YouTube channel or join the conference on Zoom. I wish you all a great afternoon, keep safe and healthy, and and I hope we meet again at the Budapest Randimbi Initiative Conference 2022. Goodbye.